Welcome all to this Future of Supercomputing event, the third in the series that seeks to inform and inspire the growing community around supercomputing and the range of sciences as well as industry it facilitates. My name is Professor Alan Duffy, Director of the Space Technology and Industry Institute at Swinburne, and more relevantly for today, an astronomer who uses supercomputers to simulate model universes. Now, as researchers, we know there is value in sharing knowledge and experiences. It is, after all, the foundation of collaboration. And our purpose in these seminars is to seek out the thoughts of experts on what it means to scale in supercomputing parlance, what it takes to scale, notably reaching the exascale of computing with machines capable of 10 to the 18 floating point operations or flops a second, or put another way, about a billion billion calculations each and every second. The Pawsey Supercomputing uh, uh, Center will soon commission its latest supercomputer named Cetonix, the Quokka's scientific name, other, otherwise known as the world's friendliest animal. Uh, this will deliver up to 50 petaflops or 30 times more compute power than its predecessor systems, Magnus and Galaxies. And those are facilities that I uh, well used and perhaps abused with poorly written code. Uh, in my own career. And this is a significant step along the road to exascale compute, uh, which would of course be a thousand petaflops. Today, we'll be exploring the research possibilities that we can expect to see in the future as scientists leverage these major leaps in technology and use exascale computing to tackle some of Australia and the world's most significant challenges. This, however, is not a webinar, but a meeting. It is about fostering collaboration and community after all. So. Please, if you can have your cameras on for our panelists to see who they are talking to. And also at the end of the discussion, we'll be opening the floor to a broader discussion for your questions, uh, as well as to connect and remain connected moving forward. Now, what panelists we have, Dr. Natasha Hurley-Walker is currently an ARC Future Fellow at the Curtin University Node of the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, where she has assisted in the commissioning of the Low Frequency SKA Precursor Radio Telescope the Murchison Wide Field Array, MWA. You will hear much about that facility, I suspect, located in outback Western Australia. A facility she used to map the entire southern sky in the Gleam survey, giving astronomers the first radio color view of the low frequency sky. We have Dr. Luigi uh, Ia Picano, uh, leader of the quantum computing team at the Leibniz Supercomputing Center and co-founder of the Bavarian Quantum Computing Exchange, performing, computer, uh, sorry, performing quantum computing simulations on high-end HPC systems and integrating these two computing worlds of high-performance computing and quantum computing. Before leading the quantum team at Leibniz, he was the team leader of the Application Lab for Astro and Plasma Physics, aka Astrolab. Uh, collaborating with researchers on numerical simulations, code modernization, and visualization of massive data sets. We have Professor Elaine Sadler, the ATNF Chief Scientist at the CSIRO's Astronomy and Space Science uh, Center. This is also known as CAS. Uh, she is also Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Sydney. Elaine provides strategic advice on the science direction of the ATNF, the National Radio Facilities, uh, and the CSIRO's Square Kilometer Array Activities. She is also co-leader of the first large absorption survey in H1, aka FLASH, uh, which is using the CSRO's Australian SKA Pathfinder, the ASCAP radio telescope in Western Australia to find out how much uh, uh, neutral hydrogen there is in galaxies and how that has changed over cosmic time. We have Dr. Pascal uh, Ilahi. He has a background in numerical astrophysics, uh, where he explored the physics governing the universe through complex virtual universes. Now, as a supercomputing application specialist at Pawsey, he is responsible for assisting researchers to port and maximize their codes onto, onto Pawsey, going from dozens or hundreds to thousands of processors. We also have Lachlan Campbell, uh, the IT consultant and astronomy specialist at the Pawsey Supercomputing Center, with a background in optical astronomy. He assists astronomical researchers to access and effectively utilize high performance computing and storage, including through training, consultation, and advocacy. And increasingly, this is being focused on the SK precursors, the MWA and ASCAP, which I've already mentioned. Now, before we get into the discussion, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I am joining you 
the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Now, it was just two weeks ago during a visit to Pawsey, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison committed $387 million in new funding over 10 years in order to meet Australia's commitments to co-host the Square Kilometre Array Observatory. The Australian portion of SKA will comprise 132,000 low frequency antennas. That means a lot of data will be generated, stored and processed in Australia. But while supercomputing is fundamental to today's and indeed, of course, tomorrow's telescopes, it's critical for all fields of astronomy. So Luigi, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you are currently the lead of quantum computing at Leibniz, but you're also an astrophysicist with vast experience with high performance computing. So I wonder, can you talk to us about these more theoretical fields of astronomy and how they interact with HPC? Yes, uh, so you, you mentioned uh, that Besides my role in quantum, uh, I am a computational astrophysics, uh, so I've done many career changes, but I think that uh, from a personal viewpoint, uh, every change is just adding something to a profile rather than complete change in a career. Uh, my approach is the one of a computational astrophysics, uh, namely to understand how simulations can contribute uh, uh, to, to this field uh, in the interplay with observations. And in the previous phases of my career, I uh, tried to investigate these, uh, in particular related also to SKA science, uh, since uh, uh, I, I worked uh, in simulations of the formation of the uh, large scale structure of the universe. Uh, in, in this field, uh, in the field of uh, astronomy and astrophysics, high performance computing uh, has a crucial role. So my experience uh, and my, my role at the Leibniz Supercomputing Center is that uh, astrophysicists are among uh, the uh, largest users of HPC resources. Among 20% of the time on uh, our uh, largest systems is given to uh, astrophysicists. And uh, uh, as the system evolves in time, uh, as they uh, go on and uh, try to uh, keep up with Moore's law, which uh, express uh, how the computing power uh, uh, evolves with time, increases with time, uh, there is a, a growing burden uh, on co-developers and researchers to try to use this computational power. The for the role of application specialist in a supercomputing center as middlemen between the researchers and the machines is increasing in, uh, in importance in these times. Uh, and uh, I've, been, I've done this experience uh, in my previous studies. Uh, uh, one of the most relevant uh, is the largest turbulence simulations that uh, uh, together with uh, Australian colleagues uh, uh, was performed on, on our center. Uh, in this simulation, it was extremely important uh, to simulate a very large uh, dynamical range uh, in, in turbulence, meaning uh, simulating equally well the large and the small length scales uh, of this system. In order to do that, uh, uh, it was necessary to use uh, for a single simulation up to 50 million uh, CPU hours uh, running in parallel on uh, about 65,000 cores. Uh, this uh, would mean uh, just making a simple calculation on a single core would have taken more than uh, 5,000 years. And uh, not only this was the effort, but also the, the data that was produced uh, was a total of two petabytes of data uh, with 20 terabytes per single output, which makes also this uh, a challenge. So we see uh, that not only from the computational viewpoint, but also how to manage uh, the, the products of these, uh, there is a, an, an increasing uh, challenge. Uh, and uh, in a supercomputing center, we try to uh, address this uh, uh, to, to make uh, the, the possible the research of, of our, our users and collaborators. And uh, for anyone who wants to follow up that, um... Uh, uh, supersonic, uh, uh, certainly the, the turbulence studies. It's it's one of the most visually beautiful pieces of simulation I've seen in a very long time, and it was uh, in in Nature Astronomy. So congratulations on that. 
um, I, I, there's links uh, back on the website for this uh, to all of these resources. So please do check that out. Now, uh, I'll, I'll throw to you, Elaine. You're, you're uh, a leader in the field, uh, it's fair to say. Vast experience in both optical and radio astronomy. Um, and as the 18F chief scientist at the CSIRO, uh, I'd like to hear from you about the SK precursor types in particular, you know, what is the current status of ASCAP? And, and we, we heard about the data products are being created by simulations, but what role are, are POSI supercomputers helping the ASCAP data products uh, and, and, and be analyzed for scientific purposes? Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, so I'm really happy to talk about ASCAP and maybe if I give just a little introduction to the telescope and the astronomy yes. first to help you have an idea of, of what we're actually doing here. So ASCAP is actually an array of 36 different telescopes out at the Murchison Radio Observatory, so remote part of Western Australia. Those telescopes are linked electronically to each other to make a telescope with the same resolving power as one that was six kilometers in size. So the idea is to have, be able to see fine detail in very distant objects. What's really new about this is that each of those 36 telescopes has at its focus uh, essentially something called a phased array feed, which is essentially a wide field camera that can observe a very large area of the sky all at once, um, unusually large for a radio telescope. The reason why it's in a remote site and why the square kilometer array will be in a remote site is really to have protection from all the radio noise that our civilization, civilization generates. Um, and if we were near a city, the faint signals we're looking for from the distant universe would be completely drowned out by people's mobile phone towers, um, car ignitions, broadcasts, all kinds of things. Um, and so the first challenge for us is that we're in a very remote part of Australia, about as far as away as it's possible to be from, from civilization. So the telescope is operating now. We have eight different science teams who have different projects they're going to do at the telescope. They've been involved in the development right from the early stages. And the thing to know really about this telescope is that it produces very large amounts of data huge amounts of data. It's about, it's rather like having a fire hose of data that just keeps coming. And so the Pawsey supercomputer is really an essential part of the telescope. It's a symbiotic relationship. So the data come out of the telescope, they go into the supercomputer, uh, and then the supercomputer handles those data and serves them up to the astronomers. So there's a lot of computational work that's needed to go from the raw data set that comes from the computer to the sort of detailed image of the radio sky that we would like to see to do our science. And so we really need supercomputing um, close, as close as possible to where the telescope is. Um, and we need a lot of space for archiving the data and making it available to researchers all over the world. So we use the Galaxy computer at Palsy at the moment for the imaging pipelines. And there's also a small cluster that talks directly to the telescope. Um, and so really without Palsy, there, there would be no, no telescope. So really important to us and very valuable the relationship we have with, with our colleagues at Palsy. As one over here and, and another uh, SK precursor telescope that has greatly benefited uh, from that close collaboration with, with Palsy is of course the MWA. Now, uh, Natasha, one of, uh, I think you're one of the first of our panelists to use the new services available at, at Pawsey, uh, particularly the new GPU cluster as part of that $70 million capital refresh. Um, uh, can you just describe what, how, how are you using it? What are you working on? And, and I guess what are those key pieces of infrastructure at Pawsey that have most impacted uh, your research projects? Sure, thanks, Alan. So yeah, I work with the Murchison Widefield Array. Um, I, like ASCAP, it's situated at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. And I think if I move slightly to the left, you can see one of the tiles um, of the MWA. Uh, the, currently, we have about 256 of these deployed in the field. And unlike ASCAP, which uses a more traditional dish-based technology, um, the MWA consists of these spider-like dipoles um, arranged across the desert. Um, and again, we correlate the signals uh, from these uh, individual antennas to form a telescope that um, has a much higher resolution than you would otherwise get. Um, so we're working at the moment on upgrading that telescope uh, to simultaneously correlate all of those 256 antennas um, as sort of testbed towards the SKA, which will of course correlate hundreds of thousands. So 
Um, the thing that I've mainly been working on um, is a large survey that Alan mentioned um, called GLEAM, the Galactic and Extragalactic All Sky MWA survey. And as implied by the name, it's all sky. So this involved taking uh, about a petabyte of data um, using the telescope and uh, shifting it down to the Pussy Center. Um, I did use some NCI systems as well. Of course, there are other supercomputing centers in Australia. And um, it was actually before that, before Pussy switched on that I did the very first uh, Gleam data reduction. Um, but what happened was uh, <laughs> Scientists don't always get things right. Science is a process of learning from your mistakes. And I did actually slightly mess up the imaging in the very first round because we were using new technology, new software, um, and we really had no idea what we were looking for in the in the sky. So um, one really amazing thing that happened was that the Galaxy supercomputer was switched on a little bit before the ASCAP telescope was switched on. And so there was a very large supercomputer, and I had a very large amount of data. And uh, I was able to use Galaxy for about a year, um, and that helped me process Gleam. So you can see behind me a little tiny piece. This is about, I don't know, 5% of Gleam. Um, and you can see the band of the Milky Way, uh, large radio galaxy Centaurus A, and hundreds of thousands of other radio galaxies, each one of which has a supermassive black hole at its center. So I've been using Pawsey technology since the beginning, um, or even beyond to uh, turn the MWA data into beautiful images of the sky. The key pieces of technology that really help me at the moment are the storage system. Um, we have a lot of data and also we don't always know immediately what we're going to do with that data. It's really helpful to be able to play with the data, to be able to test something out, try a different thing, test something out, try a different thing, and increase that amount of data that you're working with. And since lots of different groups are doing that at the same time, simultaneously, we need a lot of different, a lot of live storage. So the Luster file system, which just allows us to have something like 600 terabytes of data kind of on the go at, at a given time, that's really, really important to us. And Alan, as you mentioned, the new, G, new GPU cluster is allowing us to optimize our code and um, perform the computations more efficiently. So one of the cool things that we're doing at the moment is that, as I say, the MWA can't correlate all its tiles at the moment. So we have some old data, which consists of a compact configuration, which produce Gleam. And we have some new data where we're looking at the correlations between tiles that are very far apart. That gives us fine resolution, but we've lost all of the large scale structure. So to combine the fine scale and the large scale structure, we can use a thing called image domain gridding, which is optimized to work on GPUs. So that allows us to reconstruct uh, a more full picture of the sky. And it just wouldn't be possible without the, the new MWA cluster, Garawala. Wonderful stuff. And I, I, I won't ask what the, what the image um, mistake you made was. I, you know, leaving the lens cap on would be the obvious <laughs> uh, go-to for that. But, but I, 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 I can imagine you check that. Um, now, uh, uh, Pascal, I'm going to throw to you. You've uh, obviously, well, we've been collaborating for many years in the uh in the in the virtual simulation game but since this new capital refresh and the and new capabilities at palsy uh you've been supporting the community uh in, in commissioning these newly deployed systems now available for astronomers so can you tell us a little bit about these new systems and the support that palsy is providing to us for sure yes yes I'd, I'd love to um so i will actually just start off with something that natasha mentioned which is gleam and the amount of data they use. And one of the things we've been trying to do is to help them out. So I'm actively involved in working with the people working on the MWA. And for instance, we help them kind of process a bunch of data. They cleaned up about a few terabytes, 50 terabytes in a day, having processed it all. So you can kind of get to the sense of the scale of doing some analysis and going, oh, the 50 terabytes, we can clean this up. Gives you a sense of how much data processing is going on when you can do something at, at scale, at speed, feel like we've got now some an answer to a scientific question and so that of course is the goal here right we want to as uh the policy supercomputing center help people essentially get to their science faster and explore new scientific questions because that's since Ashley mentioned sometimes you don't know what you're looking for uh, and so you really need to explore possible different parameter spaces you need a large amount of compute hmm. a lot of a lot of storage and so on so Posi has uh, new systems like Garawala, which is uh, meant to be a, a GPU system primarily used by the MWA team, and it's got new technology. And this is something that also Natasha harped on about, and, and it's, it's good to mention that new technology is great, except it can throw you off a little bit, right? So this is, this is something where you were like, oh, I've got more rumors than I have to compute. 
how do I use it? It's not, it's not as obvious to use it, especially when you really get a change in technology like GPUs. And going forward, the new system, Photonics, which is the friendly, hopefully as friendly as the Quokka will be in terms of supercomputing, uh, is a lot of its uh, compute is provided by GPUs, by different technologies, by new technologies. And it's critical for us. We want to help everybody here, every, all the astronomers get to a, a really interesting science result, but it may mean processing 100 terabytes of data, 500 terabytes of data. Uh, and that, you don't want to wait too long per se, to of course get a science of answer, but you also want to do a bit of exploration. And so that's really tricky. It's not obvious how you scale programs right now to make use of all the, 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 the available compute. An example will be in terms of uh, Galaxy that Natasha used, Galaxies, almost all of Galaxy's available compute could possibly be done by one rack of Cytonics. So there are multiple racks of Cytonics and one rack of Cytonics will provide similar amounts of compute, but it's through GPUs. And uh, Galaxy is, if you will, run of the mill CPUs. So it's a little easier to interact with and get that compute. And it's not that obvious if you want to try to do it on Cytonics. So in, with that in mind, we've got a bunch of uh, different ways of trying to make sure that we help the community. An example would be the PACER um, program, which is meant to help people, help scientists with, with our expertise, uh, get to essentially exascale computing, take their codes and make sure they scale on 10,000 cores, on lots of GPUs, on really maximizing the IO system. Uh, and there's a couple of astronomy projects that actually are part of the PACER program, um, ASCAP and MWA, uh, related to essentially using lots of storage and lots of GPUs. And uh, th these programs essentially are really going to help the community hopefully get to some really interesting science. The, uh, uh, there's also other possibilities of we have uptake projects where we help out. So I'm involved in a couple of things. I've been certainly um, helping the MWA team figure out how to improve their code. <clears throat> That's part and part of a parcel of what we do. Uh, of course, I, I kind of love this stuff. As you know, Alan, I used to run lots of simulations uh, trying to consume as many CPUs as possible and as much storage as possible. I think, unlike Luigi, the biggest one I've ever run used, I think, 40,000 cores. So not 65,000, but still 40,000 is a pretty good hefty chunk, producing you know, a good couple of terabytes of data every now and then, right? So um, this is the scale we're going to, and uh, we're, we have a, a bunch of different programs to help them out. Um, I should also mention that as well, that in the background, some people may not know in terms of the ASCAP community, the astronomy community, that there's a new cluster that's actually taking the ASCAP data now. So there was an, a, a set of compute nodes that were available through Polity that was essentially processing the intake from the ASCAP telescope. And now that it's moved to a newer machine, which is helpfully has reduced the load on Galaxy and has improved the ability of um, Polity to handle the, the raw data from ASCAP. Um, and this was, I was part of that team kind of actually getting that cluster off the ground. So we're really actively trying to push this. And of course, we're also going to be working with Oz SKA, SKA to, to make sure that all of these um, goals, the science goals are met by essentially dealing with the compute because it's a, it's a hard issue and we're there to help. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Lachlan, I'll actually throw to you to continue this, this thought. I mean, you're very much a bridge between the astronomers using Pawsey and those opportunities available at the center and, and uh, Pascal has obviously mentioned a couple of them. So I guess I wanted you to just speak to perhaps what are the lessons learned uh, from being such an integral part of the new generation surveys out of ASCAP and MWA and how have these been reflected in the capital refresh and the other changes at Pawsey? Thanks, Alan. Um, so I've been reflecting over the last couple of days about what I could add to this panel because um, you know, the other panelists uh, are experts in the technical side and the science side. Whereas, you know, I, I wasn't an expert astronomer um, and I'm certainly not an expert in the technical side, so, but I do have um, a foot in both camps, if you like, which is, you know, essentially what I've been using to, to uh, as you said, act as a bridge. Um, and I think it's best represented the changes we're going through. Um, by going back to my early days of the PhD, which actually is uh, scarily 20 years ago, um, when I was doing a, uh, a project, a very early machine learning project, although we didn't call it machine learning in those days, um, to uh, automatically tile the sky for an optical survey. And um, uh, my supervisor said, oh, go down to, to ANU, they've got a supercomputer, you know, you can run it and it'll be great. So I went down and saw someone and, uh, they gave me a, a textbook on MPI, which was about this thick and said, here you go. 
and I went back up to, to, to Stromlo and leafed through the pages for a few days and then went, okay, I, I yeah, I, I haven't got a clue how to do this. I'm just going to brute force it. So I did. I'd, I'd run my my algorithm on a on a desktop that we had at Stromlo. And if it took two weeks, well, that, that was okay. I could, you know, be doing other things while it was happening. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was the way it was 20 years ago, but um it it's changed you can't do that anymore um we all know that there are needs for for the hbc and i think what i'm best able to uh lend to this is the fact that it's not enough to just realize that you need hpc and you need storage and you need, you need to um really take on board that it's a, a it's a commitment you have to be committed to that process you have to engage you have to be open to learning and it is going to take a time commitment um, in terms of um, pausey just in the last few years i think it's it's been reflected in the fact that we are now uh, really recognizing that that you know, researchers are our users, if you like, and we're in a service industry. Um, and so along with just supplying Satonics, it's not enough just to supply the new super special hardware. We're also doing things like uh, working hard on documentation, on training, um, on migration. So um, Pascal and I work with um, migration teams uh, for, for storage, the, the long-term storage. We're on uh, meeting every week with, with people from ASCAP and uh, MWA and ACASDA so that we're communicating with them, they're communicating with us. And so the whole process um, is all about communication and trust. And that's how things work. I mean, it's, I think it's become clear to ASCAP and MWA that the only way to make these projects work when we have such a, uh, as, as Elaine said, when pause is such an integral part of these projects, is you have to consider um, the HBC center, in this case, pause as part of the team. Yeah. Um, and they are part of your staff and you have to engage with them and you have to respect that. And that would be, I think, my contribution to this is, is to have a perspective on it, not just that we need more hardware and it's, it's new computers and you have to fund it, but it has to be part of the research process. That's, I think that's absolutely spot on, that, that new vision, new paradigm of the compute, the data storage and the telescopes all being one seamless interoperable and very much uh, uh, necessary components of each other to perform the mission. Uh, however, it's fair to say that the demand on our poor supercomputers only grows. The astronomers are horribly greedy people uh, demanding ever greater detail, ever greater refresh rates or the cadence of observation, ever greater uh, um, indeed wavelengths to cover. And the simulators are basically just as bad, if not worse, as Pascal mentioned, we just love to just run these things um, for ever greater particle counts or, or whatever the ability to scale is and to test out the supercompute. But Elaine, I might now ask you, perhaps in the context of ASCAP, perhaps even now looking forward to SKA, what are, what are the big challenges that you're faced as, as, a, as a working astronomer in this new paradigm and, and how is Pawsey helping you overcome those? Well, thanks, Alan. So I think um, challenges are certainly there. And the challenge for me is simply the scale of the data, both the volume and the rate at which it comes at you. But of course, with challenge also comes opportunity. Uh, and those two things go together. So just to give an idea of the scale of the data and also the opportunity that comes with it, I wonder if I could just tell a little story about um, some work I did when I first joined the University of Sydney, it was back in the mid, mid 1990s and a group of us had a radio telescope that we ran at Malonglo just outside of Canberra. Mm -hmm. And that had had an upgrade and we were going to make essentially the first radio imaging atlas of the southern sky. So the telescope would observe for 12 hours, usually at night. And then during the day, the data would be processed and the next night they would go on to a new field. So to cover the sky, the area that we wanted to cover took us eight years, eight year project, generously mm -hmm. funded by the Australian Research Council. Um, when ASCAP was first fired up, we thought it would be really nice just to repeat that work, things, you know, transients of sources, things have changed in the sky. Uh, we could also make a sharper, higher resolution image. Uh, and so we decided that we would repeat that survey. We would not just do the Southern sky, but we would actually do the half of the Northern hemisphere that ASCAP could also see. 
So bearing in mind that it took eight years to do this the first time, would you like to guess how long ASCAP took to do that the second time? Less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I saw something that had taken me and my colleagues eight years done better and in more detail um, in under two weeks. And then the processing time was a little longer than that. So I think that gives you the idea, not only the challenge because the data come at a huge rate, but also the opportunity to do so much more than we could do with the telescopes that we had before. That so though, that's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and to say a little bit about Pawsey's role here and helping to overcome them, because the data come at this rate that's so much higher and there's so much of it, we have to process the data quickly and efficiently. If we fall behind, we end up filling more and more storage with data and we, we, we'll never catch up. We'll just end up with more and more data there. And so we really need this new supercomputer to be able to process things at the rate that if we take 12 hours worth of data, we can process it in less than 12 hours. That's, that's the challenge. And so that's really important. Um, and that will allow us to keep up with the data flow from even the most complex of the science projects that ASCAP will do. Um, and there's a second way that we had help last year. And I think it comes back also to the issue that Lachlan touched on of trust and collaboration, because to me, that's very important when you have a project that people have your back. And what we faced in, I think, March last year is that COVID came, uh, we all went into lockdown the telescope is in a remote area. We didn't know whether ASCAP and MWA could keep operating, uh, but we were really keen that we would finish our round of pilot surveys and get the data to the science teams in a timely way. We'd already filled up all the storage that we had. And so we approached um, Mark Stickles and said, look, we're in a pickle here. We really want to finish this project in case the telescope has to shut down. We have to evacuate the site. Can you let us have some more storage so we can keep observing and put the data there and we'll sort it all out later. And, and that was done um, very quickly and in a way that I know was technically quite difficult for the guys at Pawsey. And so we finished all those surveys. We had all the data in the can. Uh, as it turned out, we were able to keep people on site, but it was fantastic just to be able to call on people and give that that level of help. So I think the more we can build that level of, of trust and understanding of each other's work, um, the more prosperous we'll be in the future. Here, here. Uh, Luigi, I, I might uh, now ask you about this, this broader race that we have uh, to make exascale compute available. Uh, uh, Japan has already reached half an exaflop and the first exascale systems announced with the US actually share common architecture with, with the one Pawsey is making available in Australia. Uh, but is it as simple as that? Is, is our exascale systems the answer? Will just simple more compute power help us overcome our current limitations? Well, uh, if I would like to be a bit provocative, one could argue when uh, the exascale era will start. So uh, when we will get the first uh, system with an exaflop of computing power or when the first top 20 of the top 50 systems in the world will enter that regime, it's, it's hard to tell, but of course the preparation work has started now, this is for sure. Um, although right now we are working on multi uh, petaflop systems, basically. Um, in my opinion, exascale uh, is not uh, a simple upscaling of the current system. It's uh, uh, potentially a completely revolutionary paradigm in, under many viewpoints in terms of uh, compute power, for example, because most of the compute power most likely will be in accelerators in that regime. In terms of uh, energy footprint, uh, the, there must be a change with respect to current systems in terms of uh, interconnecting these systems, uh, uh, the access to the data, the resilience will be very important with lots of hardware. Uh, one should have a way of uh, coping with the hardware failures in a way which is different than the current one. Uh, and this is only to mention the hardware side. From the application side, there will be similar challenges. Uh, I can agree also with the, 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 the previous speakers. So we, we need uh, to, to work together with the code developers and researchers to, to address this. And for here, the key word is co-design from three viewpoints, from the application side, from the hardware side, and also the uh, programming paradigm. So in short, I think that uh, 
yeah, Exasail system can be the answer as long as the applications, as long as the codes are able to run on this system and run means uh, uh, potentially uh, use uh, uh, most of these systems or run at the, the scale of the whole machine if, if possible. And uh, in my opinion, this is true for, uh, I would say, traditional high performance computing, but uh, there are also other parts like science data, which are complementary and also face uh, similar challenges. Uh, data science uh, scientists uh, need to rethink uh, their workflows, uh, bringing uh, uh, their software closer to the data. Yeah, important uh, keyword is also fair data in the sense of being findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and usable, uh, so that uh, uh, the, the the outcome of results in science can be useful for a longer time, uh, rather than just from the team who has generated this data. And I think that if uh, all these uh, challenges will be addressed uh, at the same time as we are doing now, then yes, we will be able to make good use of the systems at uh, FK scale. Now that, that last point, uh, Natasha, I'd like you to, to perhaps reflect on the idea of having one's data be usable into the, the future. You're a prime example of this. As you go back to reanalyze uh, um, archival data and, and one assumes that any team uh, could, could be able to access the data in, in, a, in a similar fashion, a productive fashion, I guess, what, is the, what are the challenges that, that the Rihanna uh, uh, presents? And then looking forward to the 256 tile, the full MW uh, phase two array, uh, what are those, again, the challenges, but, but the opportunities that, that access to full arrays presents? Sure, so we're really fortunate with the MWA that we can actually store the raw data as it comes off the telescope and keep it in an archive. And Pawsey have been tremendous with this, sort of ever increasing the archive space to match our ridiculous output. Um, the issue comes in when you do correlate all of the antennas together, instead of getting, you don't just double the amount of data, you quadruple the amount of data. So our archive rate is going to suddenly step up. And this is a really difficult challenge because, you know, we, we like to think of the sky as, as static to some degree. We like to think, oh, you know, those light waves from space, they've taken billions of years to get to us. They'll, they'll come again. But actually, the, the radio sky is a lot more dynamic than, than you might initially think. Um, you know, one of my students is working on um, the properties of radio galaxies. These are uh, galaxies with a central supermassive black hole that's blasting um, energy into space. And she's looking at some uh, class of objects, which initially we thought would just be static and would be, uh, you know, not moving around. It turns out that their brightness is changing even on a yearly to two yearly to three yearly time scale. So that archive has been really, really helpful for us because we've been able to go back and get measurements and then reprocess the data. So if you can't store your, your raw data, then you need to make some difficult choices up front about how you're going to process that data and then in what form you're going to store it. Are you going to keep images? Are you going to keep catalogs? Are you going to do some kind of compression somehow? Um, and I think this is a really important thing that we need to be sort of thinking ahead on over the next few years. Um, my attitude <laughs> to solve my problems has been very much make a copy everywhere. So the archive that they, mm -hmm. at the moment, um, they have to make some hard choices. And you know, one of the, the, the easiest ways to make that choice is to say, well, the oldest data gets deleted first or the data that nobody wants. And so there might be this sort of wall of, of deletion coming towards us. So I personally try and back up my data, but this becomes pretty uh, impossible on a kind of um, facility wide scale. Mm -hmm. So I think that's gonna be really tricky. Um, and it, it is a real opportunity that we don't want to miss because those measurements can't be remade. Um, and so, you know, whether that's new compression or whether that's making clever choices about processing for the different science cases um, early on, I think it's something that we need to consider going forward. I'm always struck by that, that idea that perhaps astronomy unique in science, which is based on reproducibility of the experiment, we, we just have to sit and watch and we are we capture the, the photons as they arrive and, and the universe is our one realization of the experiment but the challenge this new paradigm presents is that we're no longer able to reanalyze that data look for new things in the raw 
data at some level there's been processing decisions and, and ultimately ai systems that will have made the decision for us before a human has ever been involved and eyeball has ever seen that data as to what this night sky actually looks like and and perhaps that might be very much a reduced version of what it really is and all of the wondrous things to be discovered in it and so to tackle that uh, uh provocative idea pascal <laughs> how how is satona is going to going to help alleviate my my um, um, fear of this new paradigm that uh, we're faced with and, and really um, the end of reproducibility in science, if I can have you save it. Save everything? No, so, save so, so the scientific <laughs> field, Pascal. <laughs> uh, well, it's a tricky to feel. So I, I, should, I should preface that, I mean, Natasha's fear of, of let's say, that, that wall of deletion has to happen because storage is expensive, hard to do, and it's it's just really tricky, right? There's not an easy answer mm -hmm. to anything other than uh, trying to pick out every bit that you think is interesting. Uh, and yes, there are um, there are machine learning paradigms out there that are people are trying to use to try to pick out the interesting data. But I should point out that it is a very hard problem, right? No matter what compute you have, even given Satonics, right? Given ten Satonics, given a hundred Satonics, as kind of Luigi kind of preface to some extent, extra compute is in itself not an answer because it's just extra compute, it could be extra storage, but at some point you'll hit a wall again and you'll either take too long to do some computation or there won't be enough storage anymore. And uh, I'd say that uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a hard challenge. So you, I think we, as a community, the idea is to try to make sure that we are working with researchers to try to figure out the best way to kind of make use of the resources we have, but possibly, I mean, this is, I think, an open question for everybody to discuss is what is the best possible solution? Because extra compute, is not necessarily just the answer. Adding machine learning or adding new algorithms may in itself also not necessarily be an answer to the scientific outcomes you want because you might miss something. As I, I think um, it's kind of a good example and Natasha assumed that something was constant and it wasn't, right? And without going back and thinking about it and doing some of this research, uh, you might not notice. Now, the Satonic's answer to this might be that hopefully it won't take you as long to process so you can maybe explore different avenues uh, and different aspects of science faster to get an answer of something interesting, right? Notice something interesting that you wouldn't necessarily notice otherwise. Um, but uh, the, the overall picture of trying to save science and try to make sure that everything's reproducible and you keep everything and you can kind of go back is it's a hard challenge. I think Natasha has raised her hand because she probably wants to chime in here yeah. as well. I just Please. wanted to quickly add in um, just a few sort of thoughts about philosophy of science. So there's something very strong called the look elsewhere effect. If you are looking for your keys, you've dropped them in a car park mm -hmm. and yeah. there's a spotlight. You look under the spotlight because that's where you can see to look for your keys, but you completely ignore the rest of the dark car park because you don't know it could it could be there. But how would you tell? And so we need to we need to you know keep looking up and go wait what parts of this problem am I not am I not seeing, you know one one possible thing is that you could you could let astronomers uh, do a bit of blue sky thinking you know here's a mass massive data set put them in touch with some data scientists put them in touch with some computer scientists, and actually let them explore data without a really specific science goal that you must solve, which is a, a, a lot of a lot of the time the pressure on us is to get funding to solve one specific goal. But, uh, you know, that at that point we risk, you know, we're only looking for the keys, we might miss something really interesting uh, in the dark yeah. car park. So. Like the car. I think, that's, I, yeah. I think that's the good answer, right? Is that realistically, yeah. if we can act as a collaboration point where people of different fields can interact, where they, there are different algorithm techniques. So we obviously interacting with a bunch of different communities that may not necessarily be interacting uh, through the astronomy community, but they interact with our infrastructure. They have different mm -hmm. techniques. We can try to provide the communication. And the idea, as I said, uh, I think the overall goal is to provide extra compute so you can start doing those extra bits of exploration that otherwise you wouldn't have the time and resources to do. Now you may have the time and resources to try a different avenue, a bit of blue sky exploration, as mm -hmm. well as a specific scientific goal. I want to bring in Lachlan, uh, as, again, the bridge to talk about the, the role that AI and machine learning is playing uh, and, and supporting uh, astronomy, but, but the broader avenues of, of scientific research as well, and really trying to alleviate this, this challenge of uh, essentially look, looking for the things under, the, under the, um, the, the, the light, because it's easy to find them there, and instead better preparing ourselves to search a little bit more in the dark. So it's, it's an interesting um, point, and I, 
I did spend some time, you know, looking into machine learning as as the new way forward and things like that. But I I think for me the best way to look at machine learning and AI is is it's it's another tool. Um, I um, I ran a, a workshop just to show um, people that I mean because if you start to to look into machine learning if you try and educate yourself about it it's a it's a vast field it's a field by itself and so you say how do I start where do I look do I use deep learning do I use um, you know uh, any of these different techniques which statisticians have been you know are working on for for decades um, and. I was able to show that you can use machine learning as, as, as a tool, as any other kind of analysis or reduction tool without having to, you know, um, uh, dive into the entire field of machine learning. Um, and so I think that's, that's one way it can be very useful. But if you want to go the next step, you either have to become a specialist over time, as as some people uh, are capable of doing and do, or you have to do just as you're doing with with HPC. You need to consider working with people who are experts and and essentially making them part of your team. Um, and you know, it's the same as storage. Um, it's the same with HPC. It's the same with it, all of these evolving fields. Astronomers, certainly when, when I was doing my PhD, we, uh, you know, considered ourselves the jack of all trades. We, we learned what we needed to, and we only learned enough to do what we needed to do for that project so that we could get on to analyzing it and then get our research paper out and then do the next bit. Um, but I think as we've seen, things have pro progressed now that you, you, you simply can't do it all. Um, well, some of us can, <laughs> but most people can't um and uh yeah that would be my my response yeah i think that's that's indicative of a maturing field a healthy field is one of specialization and collaboration between those specialist areas uh with the penultimate question before i throw to the audience q a elaine you know these new technologies we've spoken now about a number um how are you, how do you foresee these shifting that scientific paradigm and and perhaps even supporting as uh, Natasha and Pascal were alluding to this, this more blue sky thinking. Oh, yeah, thanks, Alan. So indeed there is a paradigm shift and it's a shift in the way I think that astronomers work that's been gradually happening over the past decade or so, but is, is certainly accelerating now. And that's that we have very large data sets and our interactions are increasingly with the data archive and not with the telescope. Uh, that, brings opportunities in many ways because it allows people all over the world to access the data, people who might not have access to telescopes of their own. It opens up the data to citizen science projects. And in terms of blue sky, that can be one of the best ways of having people look at the data without any preconception and, and maybe find something new. But I think the challenge for us as astronomers is that we still need to understand the instrument uh, and we need to understand the algorithms and what's being done to the data to get it to the stage that it's in. Otherwise, if you see something that just looks marginally there and interesting, you have to know that, that is a real feature of the universe and not something that's perhaps been introduced as an artifact in the telescope or an artifact of the data processing. Mm. And the other challenge is how to pass on that knowledge of deep understanding of telescopes to students and younger researchers who are, who are moving into the field and make sure that we, we keep that. So that's our challenge. And I think it's, it's a very exciting one and it brings great opportunities. And I think there's a bit of a paradigm shift too for our, our colleagues at Fawzi uh, to be running a supercomputer that's part of a telescope. And we astronomers are clearly not the typical supercomputer users. So learning to deal with us and to, to make a genuine partnership that we can do great science with. Absolutely. Now, Louis, just, we, we've, we've been speaking about all these various challenges. Exascale perhaps is not the answer. Is, is there something that will be the answer to the future of astronomy to help us resolve all these challenges? Is quantum computing going to be the, the panacea, the silver bullet that, uh, that saves the science? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> by I the way, what an unfair uh, question. <laughs> I just thought yeah, I'd throw well, it uh, <laughs> Quantum, uh, so I, I arrived there where is my, my present role. Uh, and I think that uh, I, I can start from one of Lachlan's comments. Uh, 
so basically, this is uh, when we analyze uh, what is the status on the road to exascale and even post exascale, uh, we see uh, what we call uh, uh, the cycle of innovation, where traditional HVC is part of this. Uh, so, uh, doing uh, uh, science, starting from the equations, implementing them into numerical simulation, doing simulations, and trying to get uh, knowledge from simulations, uh, uh, trying to get knowledge from data with uh, machine learning, AI techniques. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, something complementary. And in the same cycle of innovation, I see also items like quantum computing. Uh, so this uh, is functional to, to HPC on this road to exascale and beyond. Mm. Uh, quantum computing, uh, uh, we can, uh, we. We analyze this field from the uh, viewpoint uh, of an high performance computing center. So, in particular, for us, it's relevant to understand how uh, can be integrated into an HPC workflow. Uh, in astrophysics, uh, this is still uh, a field uh, where there is not uh, uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, knowledge. So. The the astronomers and astrophysics are still growing into this field uh, with respect to other fields of science where there is already a bit uh, more in terms of investigation of proof of concept. We are still in the, in the uh, uh, area of proof of concept, of course. And uh, uh, the, 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 the road is quite open. Uh, it's unclear at the moment if there is uh, any specific problem in astrophysics where one can have a, a, a real advantage from uh, quantum computer, computing uh, with respect to traditional computing, but it's a very open field. And uh, uh, there are at least parts of our traditional algorithms that could be uh, ported and run on quantum systems. Uh, and. Uh, trying to see if uh, we can get uh, any any substantial advantage from from doing that, uh, integrating uh, also uh, quantum uh, as sort of new kind of accelerators on our future systems. Absolutely, and and not, although not directly quantum computing, but very much leveraging the the advances that's been pioneering. It's a wonderful discussion on on um, quantum telescopes, so optical interferometry that utilize perhaps quantum hard drives. Uh, to store the, the interferometric data uh, required. And, and um, that was uh, uh, with Josh Land Hawthorne of Sydney, a really wonderful article. I'd love to just encourage you all to review. Uh, we also have, so we're going to now go to the questions. However, while we're doing this and we can operate in parallel, we've heard about MPI, we're all capable of doing this. Uh, we're all in the compute field. Uh, if you could go to fill in the questionnaire, on, on building a better astronomy uh, a community of practice and encouraging that community to grow, uh, please go to www.menti.com. It's in the chat. Um, and there's the code 8994-3426. Please answer that. Um, now, uh, so while you're busy filling in the questionnaire, I'll, I'll start to um, ask your questions. Um, now, this one, uh, just, just to kick us off uh, from, uh, I uh, so I've not, I can't see who directly is from my apologies, but uh, I'll, I'll throw it to uh, Natasha just to get us started. Um, how are we going to handle the radio transits? You mentioned the sky changes uh, already to, to um, your own experience. Um, now those need, of course, many measurements over time. And in particular, this is in the future of the SKA where the raw data really is unstorable. So how are we going to handle that? Well, ironically, Alan, uh, this was one of my questions. So I actually really would like to hear <laughs> did from... Did you plant that question? I did plant this question. So um, uh, I'd actually like to ask uh, Elaine or possibly Pascal to, or maybe Lachlan, um, to uh, have a stab at answering that. That's yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to have a go at this. So actually, uh, one of my colleagues in, in ASCAP leads a team that's doing exactly this, looking for transients in the ASCAP data. Um, there's a couple of parts to this, uh, but essentially what you're doing is you're making a catalog of where everything is in the sky and how bright it is. And that catalog can be made fairly compact, even though there's a large number of sources, it takes a lot less room to only measure things in places where possibly you knew there was something. So that, that covers the things that vary. What about something that popped up that's that's new? Every time you observe, you make a new catalog. And if there's something that turns up in that catalog that wasn't in the catalog before, 
then you've got a new source and then you go and say, is this a real source or is something something a bit funny with the observation. If you verify that it's real, then you keep an eye on that. So really it's about taking a large set of data and turning it into a list of, of things in the sky that you found in the past and, and then seeing whether you find new things or whether anything you found before has changed. Does that make sense? That oh, real-time sure. growing atlas, as, a, as it were, of the sky. Exactly, yes. Oh, well, Lane, I'll just quickly counterpoint that. So. Uh, one thing that, that I mean, may be technical inf interferometry for people, but we we sample the data on short time scales, right? We sample the data maybe 0.5 seconds, one second, two seconds. I'm not exactly sure what ASCAPs um, receiving uh, systems do. And you can choose to make images on that cadence, or you can make images on a longer cadence. Um, of course, longer means it takes less computing time. If you use short cadence, you have to make a lot of images and then search them for objects. So again, we kind of come to this uh, effect where if we're not looking, we might not see, unless you make an image on every time step and make stacks on every possible time scale, you could miss your, your objects of interest. If you only do single time steps, you have a signal to noise problem because you are only you know, looking over whatever the telescope has instantaneous instantaneous. Yeah, so there is. The thing is a bit a, harder than that. Mm, there's a really clever way around this if you're looking for something on short time scales, and there are people in the audience who I know are more knowledgeable than me about this, but one of the other ASCAP teams is the team looking for fast radio bursts, and these are signals that only can come from anywhere in the sky. Um, often they only happen once, sometimes more than once, and they last only a tiny fraction of a second. And what that team do is they're on the lookout for a sharp signal, and then after that signal comes, then they can make the image and then they can mm -hmm. find out where it is in the sky. And that's, um, that's a really complex and, and very clever thing to do that I think is at this stage almost unique to, to ASCAP. Well, I, if I can just uh, mention, Elaine, and I mean, that approach, right, of, of, you know, you want to do outlier detection, you want to find something interesting, but the data is too large. So you have to make some cuts and there has to be some data reduction. And there's essentially no way around it other than thoughtfully, occasionally doing stuff you wouldn't normally do. So like LHC does obviously some data, they, they collect some fraction of the data produced, but occasionally they'll just change exactly what they keep. Uh, but there's usually lots of cuts involved. And so there's, you know, general things to look for. And then occasionally you just, well, let's keep, keep something here. And I think normally, sadly, well, not sadly, but that is the approach you'll have to take because it's simply not possible to retain everything. And um, uh, essentially it'll require quite a bit of thoughtful care on the people who were involved in looking for physical phenomena, <clears throat> kind of working with the people who are doing the, the, the data reduction to say, and, and how to optimize it, to say, now we try to search for something interesting, or now we're just doing some blue sky random sampling, but we don't do it all the time. And so you'll miss some, but hopefully they're not one-off events. You'll miss some of them, but not enough to reduce your statistics to two events or something like that. And effectively, that's, it's not really a computing thing, but it will be definitely an algorithm computing thing because we, we want to make sure we hit as, as close as you can to the threshold of what's available storage to keep as much as you can. And that's a discussion probably that will be a back and forth of like, how much can we actually keep and how much can we throw away and throw away the minimal amount and keep as much as you can. Yeah, I, I love the idea of the, of the random search and, and randomizing one's uh, search parameters, so to speak, to really uh, try to to be to find the unknown unknowns essentially. So I, I really find that an attractive opportunity alongside everything else um, that's been uh, suggested and presented. Um, I actually want to now ask uh, Mark uh, Stickles. Uh, I think you're sitting in the exhibition area. Could you thanks, are you able thanks. to join us? Thanks, Alan. Yes, um, great great um, presentation so far, and thank you everyone for your kind words around uh, around Pawsey and my colleagues particularly who are contributed to uh, this and uh, Pascal for answering some difficult questions on behalf of the entire science community. Um, but I've got a special guest here who has a, a question or a comment to make as well. I've got um, Professor Ron Eckers is here. So it said guest astronomy as our title. We should have special guest astronomy here. But uh, Ron, over to you. Um, uh, hi, can, uh, can you hear me? Um, one of the problems of the hybrid meeting, of course, is the people who are physically attending can't join the chat, so I couldn't uh, jump in. <laughs> so I have a question which will be to uh, Luigi, but I want to give a background, a little bit of background first. Uh, many people have seen the synergy between supercomputing and radio astronomy. Radio astronomy makes a huge amount of data, therefore we need a supercomputer. There's another synergy which I think is very interesting. 
they have both evolved both radio astronomy and computing on exactly the same time scale. The first image in radio astronomy was made by the EDSAC computer in Cambridge as one of its first uh, tasks in the early 1950s. So what has happened is the technology for supercomputing and the technology for radio astronomy have evolved together. It has always been the case that radio astronomers made more data than the top uh, super the top computers at the time could handle. It was true for the VLA, which I was director of when it started in in 1980. We had to uh, limit the amount of observations because of the computers. So this hasn't changed, and that's not surprising because both evolved with the same technology. Now the way to get around this problem is to look at what the future technologies are going to be. And so I was fascinated by, first of all, Alan uh, asking, uh, asking about the role of quantum computing in the future. And somebody also made the comment that we ought to be developing computers which can handle the radio astronomy problem and, uh, and designing uh, telescopes which are matched to what is possible computationally. Now, it so happens that the imaging problem in radio astronomy can really be expressed as a quantum problem. You've measured the coherence of the wavefront and you're trying to turn it into an image. This is a finding the minimum part rate problem. It is a classic quantum computing problem. I haven't seen anybody start thinking about how do we reformulate our algorithms based on what a quantum computer could do. So my question is, do you see approach uh, in this direction? That is, stop using our traditional methods and think of new ways of doing it, which will match the next generation of possible computers. It's a very interesting question, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that quantum computing uh, uh, has the potential of addressing uh, uh, some kind uh, of questions uh, uh, about imaging. Uh, if we think about radio astronomy, we know that uh, uh, we need, uh, uh, especially for SKA science, uh, we don't have uh, on-site uh, uh, computing capabilities uh, uh, together with an, an uh, adequate energy footprint to process on-site all the raw data and not everything can be stored as it was mentioned. So the a way out of this is to, to use some uh, uh, possible quantum workflow where the energy footprint can be much lower to uh, process this data. And this is uh, definitely uh, an interesting idea. And uh, I think that there is a, there are some thoughts in, in this direction. Uh, Right now, the main limitation, I think, uh, is uh, uh, try to understand uh, how could uh, uh, a very large input uh, be coded in such a way uh, or be expressed in such a way that a quantum computer can work on this. And there are already proof of concepts, but uh, at, at the level, of course, of uh, uh, things that I would not even call images, uh, the level of a few pixels. So the current uh, quantum systems are so small that uh, uh, we are still uh, in the in this regime uh, of uh, very small proof of concepts but uh, the, there are thoughts in in these uh, in this direction um, work, I'm working uh, uh, personally on projects where uh, this is uh, mainly addressed from the viewpoint or yeah images for earth observation for example but once this is done in one field I think these uh, uh, could uh, uh, be ported to other fields like the radio astronomy uh, quite uh, quite easily, who knows, but at some point it will. <laughs> so I want to follow that chat before I take it in a different direction. I, I was just going to mention something as well that, that might help and that Posi is partnering with Quantum Brilliance. who are nice. working on quantum accelerators. So the, here the idea is that you have a, not a full quantum computer, I mean, it's a quantum computer, it's a quantum computing element that is then uh, just an accelerator. So if you have part of your problem uh, that could benefit from quantum computing, you then offload that quantum problem, to, that portion of the problem to the quantum accelerator and get a result. Now we're testing this. So there's the quantum frontiers program that's trying to looking at exploring how effective these uh, quantum accelerators will be. 
is essentially essentially just like a GPU. You normally have a portion of compute you feel like is useful on the GPU, you then offload it to a device, the same approach. And so we're exploring this with quantum brilliance who are developing these quantum accelerators and looking at how we could begin exploring this approach of really having an HPC system where you can ingest normally sort of any sort of arbitrary data, but take portions of your problem that are suited to quantum computing and then portion them off. Um, and of, of, for Ron's question, that, I mean, that, that is part of the exploration. Like it's, it's looking at this, this path forward of exploring what is viable, what is uh, feasible, and also trying to, of, of course, upscale the policy team to understand how to interact with the scientists. We don't necessarily all scientists become experts in quantum computing, um, but the path forward is, is, is at least partially in place for looking at proof of concepts and see if it works. Yeah, very good point. Uh, I was aware of uh, the collaboration of POSI with Quantum Brilliance. We have also interesting conversation ongoing with them. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a good, uh, so what, what we are doing there is uh, opening a, a very interesting road in this field. Uh, I might just uh, throw in a little plug for a, a potential new uh, technology or at least a new utilization of it. It's one very much aligned to the sparse data sets radio tends to be, uh, or at least at least uh, astronomy more generally, as well as uh, aligned to neural network uh, searches therein, and that is IPU. So we go from CPU to GPU and now IPUs, and they offer a potentially interesting uh, paradigm that I'm very excited to try to explore. Uh, now, I do want to take us a slightly different direction, uh, and it was because I was asked, asked about this by a journalist, and uh, and I gave my thoughts, but I'm very interested to hear this captured audience. So Elaine and, and Natasha, most notably as our radio experts, Starlink is an issue for optical searches. It reflects the sunlight. And thank you to Linda McIver for this question. Does it also, also cause radio noise? And I will add to that, will it end the future of radio astronomy on this planet? Elaine. Uh, oh, oh, great. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Oh, no, that's great. No, 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 no. You no, take no, that Elena's grenade. Well, you jump on the grenade and then we'll throw it to the chief scientist. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I'd, I'd just like to quickly sort of anecdotally point out a few kind of experiences I've had with this issue. Pre-Starlink, we already have lots of satellites flying around the Earth, um, some not entirely staying inside the protected radio bands. Um, you know, the, we, we have protected bands for radio astronomy. All communications are supposed to stay outside of these. Mm, not always the case. Um, and it is already kind of happening now. So we recently took an observation with the Australia Telescope Compact Array, which is a very large dish instrument, which has a very small field of view. And we got very excited because we saw an incredible signal uh, coming into the dish and then it just disappeared again. And we were, we were sort of astonished, you know, what could this object be? What could be changing about our source? And of course it turned out to be a satellite flying right through the sort of half an arc minute beam that's like uh, a crater on the moon size. We happen to get a, a radio emitting satellite come straight through there. So it's it's already a problem. And I think for, you know, one of the big innovations in, in radio astronomy over the last few years has been um, being able to deal with the larger fields of view. So the MWA behind me, that has a thousand square degrees. Um, ASCAP has a sort of hundred square degrees. And so the chances of getting a satellite coming through are considerably increased. We also have these wider bandwidth receiving systems um, and satellites are also using wider bandwidths, so more frequencies um, to uh, for, for send more data. So yes, it is a serious issue. Um, now, as to what we do about it, um, the I know that the SK Observatory have been talking directly with Starlink and also there's sort of regulatory efforts on underway in the EU and the US. Um, I think there's a sort of, uh, it's like the equivalent of dark skies, but like dark radio skies. Um, and the, the optical astronomers are all very concerned. So everybody's kind of joining forces to make sure that we don't end up in a, in a situation where our, our view of the night sky is completely obscured. Um, but this is just a, a growing problem that has, it's, it's an exponentially growing problem but we have certainly been suffering more and more RFI, even in remote sites over the last few decades. So I hope Elaine can ch chime in with some more solutions focused words. No, I think that that was a, a great response, Natasha, and I'm not sure there's too much more I can add, except that we, we talk certainly 
uh, in our community about radio frequency uh, mitigation of radio frequency interference, the fact that there will sometimes be signals that we're going to have to deal with. And with the phased array feeds of ASCAP, there are a number of innovative technical things that we can do uh, in principle to actually follow some of these satellites and blank them out, as it were, as they cross the field. And that's in a, an early stage of development, but it's something that CSRO has certainly been looking at fairly carefully. Uh, it's easier to do, obviously, for a small number of satellites than for a large number. So that's one of the issues. Um, but again, I think it's really a question of raising this in the right, you know, all the right areas and trying to get on the front foot in, in first of all, preventing it, but also being able to deal with it effectively when it, when it comes up. But we obviously. do share the radio spectrum already with many, many different um, broadcasters and facilities. And so I think it's really just a question of making sure that everybody does the best they can to, to stick to the rules and to help us where, wherever possible. And then of course, Elaine, uh, the CSR just takes the next generation telescopes to the far side of the moon. Uh, this, is, this is a serious discussion, I think, I of the US as opposed to this as well. Um, yeah. But oh, okay. Do you want to back it? Do you want to back to commit to it? No, they're going to be these little satellites orbiting the moon, right? Transmitting back around, back to Earth. So, uh, sure. Yeah. I'm not I, sure I think we'll gateway from it, even on the moon. No, yeah. no. But hopefully, gateway is less of a challenge than two, two or, or 16,000 uh, when all the constellations are up, um, low Earth orbiting uh, um, communication satellites. Now, uh, I wanted to um, very speak about a topic that, that is certainly very. Uh, um, strongly discussed in the astronomy community and I think a growing awareness outside of our footprint and, and commute, com, uh, sorry, uh, carbon footprint. So green compute, we haven't mentioned it yet. I might open it to uh, Lachlan to get us started with that and maybe then Pascal. And it, you can come at that, of course, from both the hardware, the energy source but for the electricity, but also design of the HPC, but as well as software. So maybe just get us started, Lachlan. Yeah, um, I think Pascal's the guy to say. I, I will say that um, just from uh, the initial briefings we had about Satonics and our new systems, uh, we will rank, and I think um, maybe Mark can help me out on here. I think we'll rank as one of the most energy efficient um, HP centers, HPC centers in the world when, when Satonics comes online. Um, we also have things like um, uh, groundwater cooling, um, uh, solar collection. So from an HPC standpoint, it's certainly something. And I mean, that it, it's not just all about um, being green for HPC, it's also being about, you know, uh, efficient use of, of resources because, um, you know, the energy constraints of, of running a big center uh, comes with a big bill. Um, and if we can minimize that, then obviously we, be, we can spend more money on, on, on bigger systems and, and more infrastructure. Let's go. Yeah, so, so it has, to, of course, I should mention that I'm on one of the papers that was actually written by Adam Stevenson and, and, mm -hmm. Bean and, and Michael as well, on looking at exploring what the carbon footprint is of astronomers. And it, it was the case that we were kind of interested to see if, uh, considering we use complex facilities that actually consume power, like all the, the telescopes and so on, or the compute facilities and see where the carbon footprint is mostly produced by. And it happens to be a compute. And there's a large discussion in the astronomy community overall in the, on, across the globe about what is our carbon footprint and how do we become uh, better uh, essentially uh, citizens in terms of our, our carbon footprint to reduce it. And that in part is, since we do lose, use lots of computing, it's about making our computing as green as possible. And one that can be, try to build infrastructure that's efficient. So try to, uh, and that is the case for, for POSI, the Citonix with its enormous amounts of GPU compute uh, and even also the, the CPU uh, will have very, very, uh, it'll have a very low amount of wattage per compute cycle relative to other systems. And also because of our groundwater cooling, some of the solar panels we have, we will also reduce the amount of energy we need to uh, essentially get from the grid and the amount of energy that's necessary to cool the system. So that makes it a little greener. But in part, in part, um, one of the, the challenges is to make green compute is to make software efficient. So if you run something and you can figure out how to program something more efficiently, you suddenly maybe you needed a million hours and suddenly you need half a million. And that is better if you can actually make it efficient, you can really reduce how much time you actually need to get a, an answer. So the amount of resources that you consume and also the wall clock time. 
but it's it's a challenge because this is about looking at the software that we run, how, look at the hardware that's available, and trying to make maximize the use of the hardware given our software. And this is where I feel like it, it, Posi can maybe really help out because one of the things we ran recently was um, a training session of how to use GPUs for MWA users. So they wanted to figure out how to maybe improve the, the speed of their code that is a byproduct. It's also improving the efficiency of their code and becoming greener. And it's a good chat, discussion to have because if you can make stuff efficient, if you can make use less resources, as Lachlan said, we can maybe take the amount of resources we were spending on just power and <clears throat> do more science more efficiently and maybe even add more compute and then enabling even better science or newer science or slightly different. And so that's why um, it'd be a very interesting uh, thing to throw to the audience to see if anybody has any opinions. But I personally think it's a question of how much time and effort should we, as should the astronomy community and also us as, as a, as a facilitator to that community spend on trying to improve the efficiency of codes? Because it's very true, as much as people would love to be like, oh, I want my code to run faster. For most people, they just want an answer to a science question or at least explore some data to look for an interesting event. They're not necessarily saying, I want to run my code seven times faster. It's just, I want to get an answer. And if it can be seven times faster, great. Um, so it's an interesting thing, because I feel like there should be some motivation to try to do it, but it's hard, because obviously as a researcher, you have lots of time spent doing other things and also the science. So you can't spend an inordinate amount of time just sitting there trying to find uh, a factor of two improvement in efficiency, but maybe we can help. And uh, how that, that to best kind of facilitate that conversation so we can get greener and get newer science. All right, well, we might can... uh, throw that open to a, a poll. I actually just want to, uh, give a, a very quick plug for the AL uh, supported ADAX, so the yep. uh, Astronomy Data um, Analytics Compute Services. Have I got that right? So, some <laughs> an acronym, right? Yeah, something close to that. Um, out of uh, Swinburne and Curtin uh, National Facility, uh, the calls get put out to actually get dedicated uh, software engineers to go in and help that code be, as Pascal mentioned, more more efficient for for any numbers of. Uh, ways one can optimize indeed that as well as to be more scientifically productive. And it, and it really speaks to a comment James Beattie made about how he is a, a significant user of, of NCI compute in, in his case. Um, but the while you can go to training, as you mentioned, Pascal, that is offered, um, ideally one would have the HPC expert embedded and formally involved in the collaboration. So how, and this is to everyone, and by the way, we're running our time, so quick answers if you can, uh, to a very difficult question, but how can we best facilitate these cross-disciplinary collaborations and uh, really support, and I, I'm going to add this bit, support people who want to have a career that perhaps starts in astronomy and goes into computer uh, uh, science or software engineering or, or vice versa. How do we develop this uh, nationwide? Whoever wants to take it first, maybe a lay as chief scientist again. Um, <laughs> I just love throwing this to you. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, look, this is really important. And I think one of the issues we have in astronomy is we have a lot of very talented people who go on and do their PhD in astronomy and traditional academic jobs certainly don't, are not able to accommodate all of those. Not everybody wants to be a professor of astronomy anyway. Uh, and so I think we're always looking to what kind of careers can we uh, guide our students and our young researchers towards if they want to do something different. And I think, you know, data science, data analytics is growing rapidly, but I think I would hope, like to think that it uses the same kind of problem solving skills and techniques that we use in astronomy. So I think really to build relationships so that you can let people have a chance to intern in a facility like this, just to get a sense of what, what life would look like if they worked, worked in such a place. Um, certainly when um, I was working at Castro, we would try and actually place students and, and postdocs into internships in, in places like Pawsey or in startup companies that were working in big data. Um, so I think there are lots of ways to do this. There just has to be a willingness. And I think the more people can share experience across that, that divide, uh, the better. Alan, can I just jump in for someone oh, else? Mark actually had his hand up. Oh, sorry, Mark, I didn't pop up. No, that, that's all right, sorry. Um, I was going to just add a, the, the commentary around the optimization of code and energy 
is something that's um, not just exclusive to science. And I was going to acknowledge um, the CTO of, um, of an Australian listed company, Doug, is on board. And you can see, if you can see Stuart's screen, the orange, the orange um, uh, cells there. So just wave. Um, so the, the challenges that we're facing in science, I think, are being faced by industry that increasingly moves to these sorts of questions about large data sets, optimising codes, and the use of uh, uh, the use of high performance computing. And so it's, a, I think, a challenge that uniquely Australia is well positioned because we've got great research capability, but we've also got an international listed HPC you know, business that, uh, that's tackling these problems at scale as well. So just a, a shout out for a, another Perth, uh, Perth innovation and just a hi to Stu. And then I'll sit down. Sorry. Thanks, Lachlan. West, West is best, huh, Mark? Well, look, uh, I want to give a shout out to two links that have just popped up in the chat to do the surveys about the future, as well as the link to astronomers for planet.earth. Thank you, Natasha. Please all uh, use those links before they disappear. Um, look, we're, we're actually uh, running out of time. Uh, I'm so tempted to just have one very uh, last question, but please do answer it very uh, uh, briefly. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, again, it's more of a comment from Richard Dodson, who stated about incomplete knowledge of the telescope leads to breakdowns in the fundamental assumptions in interferometry. Uh, he, he thinks, you know, in IMO, this is the greatest risk. I actually want to broaden that a little bit more um, to the fact that we, as we mature as a field, we essentially then have more tools. We black box those tools, and we then risk the deep core expertise in its utilization because we didn't build it. And I just, that's a very difficult question for anyone to answer quickly but again if anyone wants to answer that very quickly I'll, i will just quickly i'll say okay. one thing on this topic it's perhaps not exactly the answer to your the last part of your question but mm -hmm. i will say one thing that i'm finding really um heartening uh is the formation of the australian sk regional center and forming that about 10 years ahead of the actual telescope being completed and being finished so we have an oz src team member here in Kyra, who's a computer scientist who is learning radio interferometry. And I mean, I feel sorry for them because at some point they're going to actually read the code and then be horrified. But I think that's the kind of um, cross collaboration that we really need to get used to. And indeed, I say that the code might be horrifying. I think that open sourcing our code, um, putting it on GitHub, allowing people to see it and having that transparency there so that um, all the way from you know, the telescope receiver, which is all digital, correlator, and all of the processing steps. We need to um, be able to share that and have people look at it with fresh eyes and say, oh, you really definitely forgot to carry the one here. Um, so those would be my quick answers to your question, Alan. Wonderful. Thank you, Natasha. We will leave it there. I want to thank uh, our guest panelists, uh, Elaine, Pascal, Lachlan, uh, Natasha, Mark on his cameo and the great man himself, Ron Akers. Thank you all. Uh, but a special thanks to Luigi who woke up at 3 a.m. to be here with us today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us. Remember, fill in the survey. There's many, many links uh, we've shared already. All of this information and more will be distributed in particular on the community of practice in the near future. And for everyone who joined us from the AL Organized Astronomy Data Workshop 2021, get out of here. You've got, a bet. You've got another workshop, the rest of it to attend. Please enjoy, and for the rest of you, please enjoy your day. Thanks so much for joining us.